Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classical Revolution here on IDETIO. My name is Rachel Fenlon, and I am the host of this weekly series in which I'm chatting with guests, musical personalities and artists who really inspire me, um, who are really thinking outside the box, pushing boundaries in classical music. And I'm just chatting with them about what inspires them and what sort of carries them on their artistic journey. Today, I'm really thrilled to be joined by composer Haya Chanelin. Haya is one of the most performed composers of our time. She is commissioned regularly by leading orchestras, ensembles, um, festivals. She holds an artistic, or she's held an artistic residency at the Salzburg Festival, um, as well as the Luzerne Festival. She's celebrated for her, her intensely visceral, emotional, yet deliberate and precise music. Um, she composes everything sort of from large scale opera, orchestra, music theater to intimate chamber music. Um, Haya is a Guggenheim Fellow and holds prizes from institutions like the Siemens Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, she lives in Harvard, USA, where she is on faculty as professor of composition at Harvard University. And on a personal note, this time last year, I was actually lucky enough to be performing in Chaya's opera, her most recent opera, Heart Chamber at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. And I think this is the first time we see each other since then. So please welcome Chaya Chernowin. Hi, Chaya. Hi. So nice to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much. So nice to see you after one year. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Although the year feels like maybe a strange year, like maybe a month or 10 years. <laughs> exactly. That was right. exactly the description, description I had. Either a month or 10 years. It's a very, very strange time. Yes. It's very strange. Um, Hi, I'd love to just start off by asking what your earliest introduction to music was and particularly whether there was or whether there were any standout musical moments that you feel kind of contributed to you and your path as a musician? Of course, there were many, but I will <laughs> maybe men mention only one. So I grew up in Kiryat Chaim, and, which is a small place in Israel. And um, my father and mother, who were both Holocaust survivors, um, they are the one that, of course, played the first music for me. My father was a born musician, and he had amazing views and very strong artistic sensibility. But of course, very he never studied music, or he never did. Um, he never opened any musical career. The only thing he did was to sing wherever he could and to play the accordion. And so, when he noticed that um, I had very good ears, um, he started immediately to, to teach me to sing. So the first thing I heard in my life were the Russian songs that the friends of my, my uh, father and mother were singing together with the accordion, with many voices. That was my first introduction to music. And interestingly enough, also the first moment that I remember that really made an imprint on me, or I guess I was told about it by, by my mother so many times. It was a, a, a moment that was connected to music, to Russian music, because it was a, a movie that was called Biryoska. And it's a movie where, you know, you have the, the Red Army dancers dancing and the ballerina, the Bolshev ballerina dancing. And you have all this Russian music. And I was sit sitting all this movie and I was crying. The whole movie, especially in the break, I was just, couldn't stop crying. And everybody was trying to console me and to find out why I'm crying. And I said, my mother said, so why are you crying? It's such a beautiful movie. There is nothing sad about it. And I said to her, but it's so beautiful. And I was <laughs> crying again. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I was about four or five at this time. Okay. Wow. Um, and so 
I mean, I'm curious the beginning stages for you. So singing was your kind of first interaction with music. Um, and when did composing come for you? At what well, stage? then I, I started studying piano. Okay. Which, which was a really, really interesting <laughs> beginning because I had the weirdest teachers ever until I got to an amazing teacher, Shoshana Fisher Herling, who was really dedicated and was also an extremely uh, wise educator. And um, yeah, she taught me piano and not only she taught me piano, she knew I was not practicing. So she used to invite me to her home for full mornings and send me to practice and make me lunch so, so that it will happen, so that I will, when I had you know, an exam in the conservatory or so. Um, and that's when the composing started. It started in the age of 13. And I actually started composing uh, at first very modern melodies with chords which I would write very fast on a piece of paper. And yeah, I didn't know it, that it just came. I think I saw a movie, again, the movie was very sad. And then I, I do remember it was a movie about um, a couple, I don't remember the name, but the couple, somebody died and then they see each other in the next reincarnation. It was a very strange and sad and uncanny movie after which I wrote my first ever composition. And then I continued to write um, progressive rock music. At the age of 16, I had my band with all my guys, etc. Okay. And how, how traditional was your training um, during university and getting your PhD? And I mean, I'm, I'm curious about, I, I read in your biography that you spent also some time in Japan uh, for two years and that that was like very an instrumental time for you as a composer. And I guess my question would be, how traditional was the beginning of the education and at which point did you feel you sort of found began to find your really, what you now have this really unique singular um, voice as a composer. I think that, um, yeah, the, the search or the need to express myself in a singular fashion, not what I know, it was there from the beginning. Um, my education was extremely traditional and on the highest degree because I was studying, uh, first of all, I, 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 you know, I'm, the same, I'm born in December, which meant that my army service in Israel was uh, postponed because I was, you know, the, the youngest in my class always. And so I had a year until my army service after I finished high school, and I was accepted to the music academy in Jerusalem and studied with Kopitman, who was a Russian, traditional teacher, an amazing musician, and a very good composer and a very good teacher. I studied with him for a year and then I went to the army, which didn't end so well. <laughs> and I found myself in the age, age of 19 in the Tel Aviv Academy. At that time, the Tel Aviv Academy was blessed with giants in Israeli music. And all of them were actually European. We had Abel Ehrlich, my very dear teacher, and he was from Germany. Um, we had uh, Itzhak Sadai, who was actually Hungarian. We had Andre Haido, and all those people were um, steeped in, in actually in the, in the tradition of European culture and were amazing teachers. I should not forget uh, Mordechai Seter, who is one of the most greatest Israeli composers and teachers. So all of these people uh, we could study from, and we had an amazing class so, of composers. So that was my education. It was extremely traditional. 
And, but, and yeah, no, no, sorry, continue, continue. No, no, just to say that even when I was composing rock music, yeah. it was not your normal rock music. And the truth is that it became weirder and weirder and weirder. <laughs> Just so that you understand, our band was called Pandora Box, Pandora's Box. So. <laughs> to begin with. And um, at some point, my friends told me, you know, Chaya, it's amazing, but it's, it's really strange. And right now it's beginning not to have a groove and it's even not tonal. So maybe you should do, you know, you should go to study. Right. Interesting. And how about, so how about this time in Japan um, and Germany? You also spent time in Germany sort of post-grad, is that right? Right, so after the, after the time in, in Tel Aviv, yeah. I went to, to Germany on a BAAD scholarship and studied with Dieter Schneider. Yeah. yeah. So... Um. Um, I don't know if you knew Dieter. Um, I, I didn't, but I know some of his work. He's actually, he's one of the few composers who wrote songs for a soprano to accompany herself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do. We should do very well, I know. So I have some songs. I'm a, I'm a big fan of him. Yeah, he was a person that really thought outside the, bo the box. And um, he was a person with an amazing personality, just the person himself. And the person, in his case, you know, sometimes we say there is the artist and there is the person. In his case, they were very combined in chorus. Yes. And um, yeah, he, he was a, a very unique, you know, in the time of, of after the war, and a bit later in the 60s, 70s, where everybody in Middle Europe and in Germany was trying to start from the beginning, to start anew with, uh, you know, the, the total serialism or all kinds of um, ways of actually rebelling um, against, um, against, what, against the past that led them astray in history. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that he was one of the only people that really wanted to look at the problematic. So he did not, um, Dieter did not cut exactly from tradition. He just tried to look at it from a different angle. And he was not suggesting new solution. He was looking at the questions. And I really appreciate that. But, mm -hmm. um, interesting. Um, there's this uh, wonderful interview with you, um, actually from last year when you were preparing the heart chamber. And there's a sentence that really jumped out to me and I wanted to read it and then ask you a little bit about it. Um, and so you say in quotes, I couldn't live or compose if I wasn't in communion with nature. I'm her pupil, she teaches me so much. Um, and this really struck me because I hear this element in your work so much um, and first I would ask what does that communion with nature look like for you? Um, it has to do with um, listening, watching and um, kind of really um, being open to to, to the wonders of which surround us. I'm sitting in, here in the room and I can show you my window for a moment. This is my window. So beautiful. And you can see that it has a very amazing light. Mm -hmm. So as I'm, as I'm doing things, sometimes, you know, I will the sun would come through, or today, for example, we had a huge amount of leaves that were just jump, that were just coming down. And you look at the leaves 
you look at the leaves for 10 minutes and it's really, it's a really amazing composition lesson. It's not boring for a moment because every leaf has a certain way, has a certain way of flying. The rate in which they come down is very, very different, very individuated for every leaf. And then, you know, there was light suddenly in a place that there was no, and the whole atmosphere changes. And, and an hour later, suddenly there is a burst of wind and all the leaves are coming down. Whereas before it was just one after the other. Um, you look at this and you really learn about events, about, you know, how events are spaced in time, the variability of parameters in the events, and how light, which is a totally different element, can change the whole perception of an event. It's endless what, can, one, can, what, what one can learn. Uh, you can learn about the relationship between energy and weight and gravity when we see the, 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 the and, and I'm not a physicist, but those things are very important for me to know because when I'm writing um, a sound which is falling down, in order to do it in a clear and believable way, I need to think about the heaviness of the string, the heaviness of the hand with the bow on the side. That's how I study for nature. That's how I look. I look. Yeah. yeah. And so something like, like light, what you said about light, this is so beautiful. And how would, is that something you think about in your work? I mean, with this, how would light manifest in a musical composition, for example? Yeah, if, you know, if you, um, all those things are very physical. Let's imagine that you are singing and you are singing with all your body. So you are using also all, all, all the resonances that you have and you are singing a very low, low pitch. And um, that would be probably, we have, if, if you are using all the heaviness and all the resonances of your body, it will have a certain kind of fullness that could be translated as heaviness that could be connected in the color to some kind of darkness. Mm. That would be very natural to do. It would be much harder to use all the resonance in a low pitch and to make it shine, light. Then you would need in the cavities to create a certain kind of, um, you know, um, a, a color, you know, of, of the syllable. I forgot what they are called, formant. You would need a certain formant. But now let's imagine that you are taking the pitch as a, as a kind of a fundamental and you succeed to show a, an overtone or you are singing two octaves above it. that immediately will create a kind of a light coming into the tone. You could create, I mean, processes that um, are, are applied on, 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 a, on something that is not changing and really show how colors change. And a change of color can be equated in a certain way to a change of color. That's so amazing. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I know you also use a lot of, you use a lot of field recordings or you have used a lot of field recordings in, in your work. Um, what dimension does that add to music for you or to a piece? It's, it's very similar in a way. The salt is the same salt sinking, just in a different dimension. So, so you know, I explained it through the voice, it would have been even easier to explain it through a string instrument, you know, playing the pitch and then playing the overtone of that pitch, yeah. that that would be putting light into the, into the pitch. But now if I'm thinking about the, the, the recording, yes, the recording can supply the kind of the, 
Well, I mean, there are many functions for the field recordings, but one of them is to create a universe, to create a, a, context, a context for from which um, what happens in the front, forefront is, is happening. So, you know, you create a context by, for example, um, you, can, you can even um, have very few field recordings. Let's say that you are recording the resonance of a huge train station, which has a very huge extent and if you mm -hmm. if somebody is talking you hear it everywhere the reflections let's say that we record that kind of that kind of resonance you even don't hear anybody talking it's very very far away but you put that resonance and you kind of put it as a part of what's happening in uh -huh. that moment and you created a very strange superimposition of a room that was not there. Um, I will give another, a better example. In the piece Hidden, which is a piece for a string quartet, um, there is a place where there is a cord that disappears, and it disappears over a very long time, much longer than its normal decay. And at the end of that time, I looked for silence that will be excited, special silence, so that it almost disappeared, but it's still there. And I found a silence that happened before Obama was speaking outside in front of a huge public. There were two seconds of silence where you feel nothing happens there, it's silence but you actually do feel something. Wow. We took that and we used it uh, for that small tag moment. And we succeeded to melt it and to, you know, to form it so that it grew from the silence that we achieved. So, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. It's as if they, like what you describe, it's as if it, um, it's not that it takes on a character, that's not, maybe not the right word, but um, an, an instrument even, like it's, it, they become, but you can be in dialogue with it because you can manipulate it. If you make sure. That's incredible. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm so curious. So you've written four, four operas, two grand scale full length operas, um, and two chamber operas, is that right? Um, actually, well, it's complex because Pneuma is a chamber opera, but it does have a string orchestra. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, that's maybe, maybe not so chamber. And uh, Saida Adama includes Mozart, Saida. So, you know, yes. you have actually the whole Mozart orchestra and the whole Mozart uh, lineup. But Said has only 18 instruments and two people. So, yeah, it is chamber, but it cannot live outside of, of the motel. I see. Um, and so, when you're composing an opera, so when you, let's maybe take Infinite Now or Heart Chamber as an example, because they're such big, large scale productions, amazing pieces. Um, I'm so curious about your about your process. Um, so I was I was wondering first, how long would you set aside to write an opera? Um, some just some really basic curious questions, like yeah. Well, um, you know, actually, when I worked on Nima, which was when I was in the beginning of my forty, um, I had two years. I took two years to write Nima. Uh, of course, I had a small child uh, back then. <laughs> my, my, my son was, um, he was, he wasn't so small. He was already five years old when he started. But that's an age when he needed me a lot. Um, yeah, so two years were actually 
kind of, I had to make a huge effort to make it happen. I remember calculating how, ma- how many seconds I have to write every day. Yes. <laughs> kind of scary towards the end. <laughs> so that took two years. Now, Saeed al I'm not sure because it was postponed. So I think I took, I took quite a long, also something like a year and a half. Infinite Now was strange um, because the truth is that I wrote it. It's a two and a half hour piece which I think I wrote, I mean, the writing itself, it took a year, which it's unbelievable for me in terms of the writing. It's unbelievable. It's just, and also the way that it came was like, you know, direct and unstoppable bulldozer. It was just going forward and you couldn't stop. It was in a very difficult time in my life yeah. because my mom, my mother was, I had Alzheimer and it was the last stages. Oh, so I wow. think that it was, it was very existential. Yeah. I, I was holding on to infinite now. Oof. Okay. And it was keeping me, it was my alternative universe. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then with, with Heart Chamber, what was, what was that? And her chamber was, again, very different. So I was sure after the experience of, in, of Infinite Now that her chamber will come very fast. And um, most of it was, and it was very inspired. But the end gave me so much trouble. I could not, I, I could not trust the end. I wanted to do something I had something in mind which was too difficult to catch. And I was so close to the end, but there, it was almost rehearsal time and the end was not yet happening because I could not find the right way to, to get to, to, to that vision that I had, which was really particular. And I somehow finished it, but as you remember, I added to the yes. end. A lot, especially to to yeah, you. I remember. I remember. Yes. So during the rehearsals, I actually added for the end very meaningful parts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for us, that experience was so great because I think that's how operas were composed in the from the very beginning with the composer, you know, making adjustments and. So I, I, I loved that. It felt very alive. It felt very alive. Yeah, it was an amazing experience to work with, with you all. I don't know how, how they made it happen to have a group of people oh. who were so open and Ever, so intelligent. I mean, yes, it was, a, it was a huge, in the end, huge, huge thing, huge ensemble. That, and we had Nick, Ensemble Nickel and an 80 something piece orchestra, or I mean, at least yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 And actually I had, I also wanted to ask you about, about that many times, but something unique for the, for the listeners about this opera is also that Chaya wrote the text herself, the libretto. And so my question for you would be, um, what, what, the, the, the question, what came first to the text or the music, or did they come at the same time? And, how did they interweave for you? You know, um, the truth is that, um, it, of course, it's all about the music. And um, I'm not a writer, and I do not pretend, or, you know, I, I, I'm really not. I've worked on music all my life since I was 13. I was, I was writing poetry when I was young, but... Uh, it was not something that was sustaining itself. Um, and um, the text came, I had to write the text first, but if I didn't have an idea about the music and, and what I was looking for, the text would never have come. Mm-hmm. So the text was already, um, they were kind of, the text and the music were both 
you know, like when you when you um, climb a wall, like a sport, or when you climb rocks, you yeah. always have triggers. You have things that you hold on to, and let's uh-huh. say that in the right hand I had the text, and in the left hand I had the music, and that the way that I climb, and that's oh. the way that. <laughs> And that's the way that I discovered what is my rock, because I needed to discover that rock in both the music and the text, and, and the text were helping me to figure out that rock that I was climbing. Oh, I love that. What a great image. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's hard to, to, to explain that, but they, yeah. those things work together. Yeah. Um, something you kind of spoke briefly about already when we were speaking about nature and it, it um, that it came up then, but it was a, another question that I had for you um, in general. As a composer, I'm, I'm always so fascinated to hear about your relationship with time and how, um, how that shifts and changes for you. Um, so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about that and whether, yeah. Well, I mean, that is for me, of course, every composer deals with time. We always do. Every music maker deals with with time. Uh, But I I would like to say that in particular, I see myself as a researcher of time. Even when I spoke about the leaves or nature, nature is manifestation of time. Everything is manifested. And I've been dealing with directly figuring out how things work in time for for many, many years. And so um, in relationship to the opera, we can connect this to the opera. If you listen to Prima, my first opera, it's like a very sensitive seismograph. Everything is very fast. Everything is, you know, breathless almost. the, the tempo, the information is just overwhelming at time because there is a lot of it. And um, everybody is an, a soloist in a way, in the instrumental soloist. And even the orchestra is playing like soloist. I mean, the voice of the orchestra is not really accompanying. They are really singing or, yeah, in the kind of a soloistic role. If you compare that to infinite now, they seem in terms of time, like a huge different universe because infinite now is, is endless. Time does not exist in infinite now. It's really um, elevated and um, it seems like everything has to go for its full temporal unfolding. So no jumps, no getting to the end, a very slow, natural decaying with everything which is entailed inside. I would just like to, to take the opportunity and say that if somebody is curious about infinite now, it is on YouTube, if you just, um, Look for it, it's um, an opera vision and infinite now in my name. Anyway, um, that's a very extended temporal canvas, but time in a way stands still or is elevated. In heart chamber, I took all the knowledge that I have from Pnema to infinite now. And I think that heart chamber includes all of them and is really modulating between different time perceptions. And even um, it's, it's kind of uh, polyphonic. You will have a recording which moves in the rate of infinite now and something very fast in the forefront, etc. So, I think that with every opera, the approach to time is very, very different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, something else that I read about, about actually about Infinite Now, um, 
I'm just going to get my notes. Uh, is, yes, please. Yeah, this was this was in Van Magazine. Um, and uh, you were talking about, it, I think specifically the article was about Infinite Now. And you, you say that there's something um, really holistic about the opera. It's not merely the abstraction that music can give you, but it's really connected to life and it brings voices to reality. Um, and I was just curious to hear you talk a little bit about um, yeah, about that, about this idea of, of what, make, what makes opera for you is that it's not necessarily abstract, that it's, that it's functioning within a reality. It just piqued my interest a lot. It's a good one. <laughs> you, you, uh, you got, yeah, you kind of hit in one of the nails on their head. Um, I mean, in some way, um, there is a wish of mine or, or there is an intention or there is work towards really creating the universe always. And so that universe is something of a reality. But when you write opera, there is, the op operas are, they can be very abstract, but an opera de terra is very abstract, but when I give it to a director, for example, to Klaus Good, it cannot stay abstract. He's not going to just make, you know, a, a, a dark hole and everybody just hear the music. It's not going to stay abstract. And then the, that kind of, um, the zipping in of the concrete energy that comes into opera, it, it comes into the composition itself in a strange way. I can't explain it, but I think that in my operas, um, my voice become, even though it's as, as, as abstract as usual, but it has more, more hooks towards reality. I can't explain yes. to you what are those hooks, but- <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> I will, just ex I will just say something very general. That, you yeah. know, I can write a piece for voice where the voice never sings and the voice becomes not human voice. It becomes the voice of wind or a, a paintbrush which paints. Yes. In the opera, this would not happen. The voice is human. And um, that, that is the directness I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. One, one, one example. One example, yeah. And I mean, as well, that there's always a narrative as well. So that's the... Even if it's not a narrative, it is exactly. a narrative. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I should, I should definitely correct that. Um, yeah, but... Yeah, um, because, for example, you could say the text of Heart Chamber in a way was very, it was very poetic. It was essentially, for me, it felt really, really like poetry, um, but we did have our, our anchors to a story and anchors to an experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so definitely something else I wanted to ask you was um, having accomplished, you know, so much and, and explored so many, so many genres within, within this, musical world where are there any things you want to that you plan to or want to look more at in the future more opera or yeah I'm, I'm, I mean without of course I'm sure you can't give too many details but I was just curious sort of if there are new things that pique your interest or working with new mediums or well to tell the truth I've been studying with my colleague at Harvard Hans Tushku who is an amazing um, electronic music, musician and composer. Mm -hmm. And he's generally a composer, but also does a lot of electronic music. And I'm studying with him uh, how to do the electronic music myself. That's one thing I've been doing. Cool. Um, I mean, a lot of things are opening now. I've also yeah. been... Um, photographing and uh, taking a lot of small videos of nature. And I, 
I am not doing that professionally, but it's possible that at certain time I would want to integrate this into my work. I don't know, there is a kind of an, I'm not sure that the interdisciplinary um, branch is going to, to happen because I, I have a lot of respect to the investment of the, I don't know, 21,000 hours, what is it called? You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The time that you need. I think it's actually only 10,000, I hope. Oh, okay. Fine. <laughs> Ah, it goes to show. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm not sure that in my life I will succeed to, to integrate and I will not do something dilettante. Just, you know, I'm not feeling courageous enough to just go and do stuff. I probably need more time of something to grow until it ripen, ripens. But um, a lot of things are... are there in, I think that in music itself, there is so much more to discover for me. And for example, after Heart Chamber, I really had the need to write a very large scale piece in opera, but for a very small group of performance, performance, because all of my operas are huge. And I really wanted to have an opera which is completely chamber, and I'm doing it with the my vocalist, and so just six people. Oh wow! A whole evening of of six people. Yeah. So that is, for example, where things yes. are going. Yeah. Um, going I, as a so you've been on faculty at Harvard for since. Is it 2007? Quite a while, or? 10 years, uh, actually 11 yeah. years. Okay. And what's your approach to, I mean, that's a very big question, or vague question, but um, I suppose what, yeah, what, how do you approach teaching young people composition? I mean, is it, um, is, do you have sort of a general, I mean, you must have, yeah, I'm just curious what this, what this um, philosophy is for you when you're teaching uh, young like, students. You know, as I said, I'm really putting my time in working and I'm still putting it in, yeah. I'm still learning. Um, my students at Harvard are always people that I believe I can learn from. So our exchange is never, uh, has no, no, it has no seed of authority, 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 authority. Yeah. it's very equal. Yeah. And what we are doing is exactly what I explained about the right and the left hand. Um, I'm trying to be a second voice to the students to help them discover what needs to, what they want to discover. And I do it to the best of my ability, and I can be quite helpful in that. But I also have to be very adjustable because it's not about what I think they would <laughs> like to do, but it's about the quality of my reading of what they really would like to do. And my adjustment to, to that picture where I'm not mm -hmm. accurate and when they are not accurate. So, when I'm able to adjust, you know, if you're like in conversation with a person, in the moment that you give certain qualities, the other person will answer in the same way. So if I'm adjusting my do, and if I'm teaching to respect the kind of vision which is not yet discovered, the student will do the same. Mm -hmm. And so that we are both hunting for something that we respect and, and want to figure out. It has nothing to do with their ego or my ego. That's taken away from the equation and then the work can be very, it can be very helpful, the work to be done. I believe it. I, I think that's so beautiful. Also, it's, it's like um, 
a real relationship. It's a dialogue and... Absolutely. Yeah. It always is. That's very special, I think. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. And I experience it as such. Yeah. 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 Well, Chaya, it's been such a pleasure. I could just talk to you for um, hours. I know. <laughs> I, 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 there's so many other things I wanted to ask you, but um, I would, I think it, I would, I would love to ask you the the question I I always like to ask at the end, um, which is sort of hence the the title of the show. Um, how can how do you feel music can be revolutionary? Would be my question. Can music be revolutionary? I mean, you know, what is revolutionary? Um, and why, why is that? I mean, for me, music is existential before it's revolutionary. It's evolutionary before it's revolutionary. Yeah. And when you, when you are dealing with music on an existential level and when you are following its own evolution and you're allowing it to, to happen and revolutionize your life, that in turn will help to open other people, other people's lives, people that are in your environment, you know? And it's just music is something that um, it's not, I wouldn't just say that it's revolutionary. It's for me much more than that. Revolutions <laughs> are only a small part of history. But music, you know, I just discovered yesterday this YouTube uh, short movie about this um, dancer of the New York Ballet. Who, you see her when she is about 90 and she has Alzheimer's. You saw that. Yeah. And she's hearing a uh, swam lake and she starts from her wheelchair to, to, to dance. And you can see her spirit and you can see her spirit soars and you can see that she totally became herself and totally human again in such a way. Um, is this revolutionary? It is existential. It's, you it's know, Everybody is trying to tell us that we are luxury now. They close our holes. We are just luxury so we can wait. We are not luxury. We are existential. Somebody can be really hungry and not eat and still they are painting. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, that's that's yeah, that's exactly. Um, it's it's so nice to hear your thoughts, Chaya. Thank you so much for making time. Um, no way to. It was a lovely meeting. Thank yeah. And so I wish you all the best. Stay uh, well and healthy and uh, in your musical universes. And um, hope to see you again soon in person. I hope the same thing. Yes. We will talk the next time. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. And to, everyone, to everyone who tuned in, um, make sure that you yeah check out Chaya's um, operas on YouTube and also her discography in Idagio. There's a lot of incredible, incredible works by many different ensembles um, and artists. So enjoy. Thank you and see you.